Hey everyone, welcome to the Bright Podcast. If you are joining us for the first time, in this podcast, we learn how to grow member-based organizations. I am your host, Farhad Khan. I am the CEO of Gripe Digital. We are a digital agency and we help member-based organizations grow their membership with digital marketing and by building membership portals. Um, if you want to grow the membership of your professional association or your member-based organization, please take a look at the um, workshops on our website at gripe.ca slash workshops. That is G-R-Y-P-E dot C-A slash workshops. We are trying something new this time. We are doing a live recording of our podcast and uh, there's a live audience as well. So towards the end of the podcast, we will actually take some live questions from the audience as well. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to type on chat and we will pick up uh, the questions from the chat window um, whenever we have a bit of a gap. All right. Uh, today we have Wes um, Trockel uh, with us and Wes is actually a database management guru and he is an author. His work has been published on many, many publications and he has helped many, many associations and member-based organizations with their member data management over the years. With that, let's jump right in. Wes, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you start by telling us a bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, Farhad. Uh my company is Effective Database Management, and for the last 22 years now, I've been consulting with associations on all things related to data management, uh, which, of course, could be the AMS as well as uh, content management systems, learning management systems, and so on. And prior to that, I worked for almost 10 years in associations as Director of Membership and Marketing and Customer Service. And so part of the perspective I try to bring to my clients is... Um, you know, what the staff's going through on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as helping the, the members and customers have the best possible experience they can have with the association. Right. Wes, so um, why is it so important for someone to actually have a good strategy or plan in place for their member data management before they put anything in place? Why is strategy important? Well, I think the, the, the primary reason, of course, is that we want to make sure what it is we're trying to accomplish with any data management system and so um, obviously having a strategy in place or at least understanding what it is we're trying to accomplish. And so if you're, you know, if you're starting with no system, usually it's just getting control of your data. That's, that's, the, yeah, that's the goal. But uh, if you've had a system in place and you're trying to improve what you're doing, then you're kind of moving up the, the hierarchy. I actually have created a hierarchy many years ago, data management hierarchy that talks about control of data. And so um, again, at that foundation is just control the data. And as we're moving up, um, getting to the point of actually using the data. And so to your question, really the reason we need a strategy is because we want to understand what it is we're trying to do before we kind of just run down the street, plug in technology and start doing things. Right, so what are common mistakes that you see people often make? Well, I think uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of them, um, but uh, I would say a, a couple that rise to the top one is trying to do too much too fast. And so, uh, again, no matter kind of where you are in the spectrum in terms of how you're managing data, uh, there's a tendency to say, we've got all these issues and all these challenges and all these problems, and we need to fix them all. And obviously that's understandable, but the problem is that if you try to do everything well, you wind up doing nothing well. And so my advice often to my clients is make sure, A, that you understand the list, what it is you're actually really trying to do, but then look at that list and prioritize, really start with three, no more than five things that you wanna really fix or improve and focus on getting those done. Um, on the flip side, and kind of contrary to that is at the same time, look for the low hanging fruit and the quick wins, because then as you have these quick wins, uh, that it, uh, improves momentum and keeps you going in the right, right direction. So with that, Wes, um, do, you, do you prefer that people build out their member database like in stages and not try to do everything at once and then kind of like have an initial plan for the rollout, right, with the most important things and then like maybe have like a rough plan of like uh, what's going to like come after? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, again, that goes to that point of don't try to do everything at once. I always joke with my clients that um, during an implementation, there's there's the stuff that has to be done at go live, which is phase one. And then everything else is phase later because later mm -hmm. is going to, it's anything that's after go live. And that might be phase two, might be phase three, might be phase four, but it's going to come at a different time. And so again, that goes back to making sure you understand your priorities, 
what does the system actually have to be able to do upon flipping the switch? And so, uh, you know, some good examples of that, um, we need to be able to let members join and renew online. If that's a must have, that's a must have. And so the system has to be able to do that when we go live. Um, on the flip side, it, and frankly, for a lot of my clients, being able to join may not be that important because most people don't join online for that particular association. And so having an online join process, not important. A renewal process, that's a different story because once they're members, we want to be able to be able to automate that and make it as easy as possible for them. So it's really looking at those, uh, again, the priorities, everything you want to be able to do and saying, okay, what is the stuff that we have to be able to do at Go Live, And being honest about what you really need to be able to do. Because if you've been getting by on spreadsheets and the phone the whole time, then the reality is you can continue to do that. You could continue to do that, um, assuming your association is not failing. But, um, but so realistically, you don't have to have everything as soon as you go live. So prioritize. Right. And, and I, I guess, I, uh... I'm sorry, Fahad, I would just add one other thing is that it's really important to kind of, and this is across the board, but especially in terms of prior, prioritization is to look at what your organization's mission is and make sure that what you're doing addresses that. So in other words, if it's not mission critical or if it doesn't apply to the mission directly, then it probably isn't or probably shouldn't be a priority. Right. And oftentimes what happens is that like when you start with the most important things and you go live, you are able to actually like test your ideas and test your like whole like member management system with with real users. And then like that will actually inform you on a lot of other things that you may not have thought about before. So I think like, yeah, that's, by... that's, a, that's a great point. And I, I would, I would add a couple of things too. One is, um, uh, again, my, my rule of thumb is if you're switching systems, let's say you had a system in place, whether it's totally custom built or off the shelf, if you're switching systems, everything your members and customers could do before online, if they were using that should be there at go live. In other words, if you take things away that they could do before that could upset people, um, that's, that's kind of the first thing. And then, uh, like you said, just making sure, make sure you've tested things and that as you release kind of new functionality to the masses, so to speak, um, you may learn something from the feedback, including maybe they don't care. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the reality is that uh, just, I'll, I'll use trade associations as an example. A lot of systems will allow a primary contact to go on and update their company membership and all the people, all the employees associated with it. But my experience, both as a trade association manager, membership manager, as well as through my clients, it doesn't happen that often. In other words, it's a small percentage of members who will actually take advantage of that functionality. And so maybe it's not so critically important to build that out right away. Right. And you also mentioned that uh, you need to make sure that um, the CRM or the member database actually aligns with the company's business objectives. We need to know the company's mission. Uh, so w what are some things that uh, we should be doing to make sure that our CRM plan or the whole member database aligns with the business goals? Well, I think, you know, the key is understanding what your mission is and making sure I was, in fact, I was having this conversation with a client earlier today, working on a, a data governance project. And we were pointing out that with a data governance um, uh, pro plan in place with a document in place that says, this is how we manage data and why we manage data. You can use that as a reference for whether or not we should do this new project. In other words, does the, again, does the project reflect what our mission is? And so, you know, a simple example of our mission is really just to educate our members about uh, the issues at hand, then the, probably a lot of things fit into that. Um, if our mission's more um, motivated by government relations and things like that, again, whatever this program is that we're going to be doing or the functionality that we're offering, does that fit that mission? And so I think you, know, you just always have to go back to is what we're doing, does, <laughs> is what we're doing apply, does it apply to what we should be doing? Right, right. And uh, do you see that like the data that we're collecting or data we are tracking with the member data management system like uh, should inform our marketing and sales efforts and beyond? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of the reason I got in this business in the first place is because uh, when I was director of membership and marketing at my trade associations, um, I always wanted more data about more information about the members and customers I was talking to. So this, I kind of predate the internet in those jobs. So it was all about direct mail. 
And so I wanted to make sure it was very expensive to, to market. And so I needed to make sure I was talking to the right people about the right things. And the more data I had, the better. Of course, now we have, um, you know, electronic marketing like you guys do. And so that in a sense, you know, I put in air quotes, that's free marketing, right? It's not terribly expensive to tell everybody in the world about what you're doing. But of course, the reality now is if you're telling everybody about everything, nobody's actually listening to you. They're completely tuning you out. And so we can use the data to make sure that we're talking to the right people about the right things. And, um, you know, my, my smart clients have been able to do this for a while now where, where they very rarely send a broadcast email to everybody in their database. They're always um, slicing and dicing. They're always narrowing down that target to make sure they're only talking to the people who should be hearing that message. Right. And do you have any thoughts on like how we should approach the audience segmentation? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, you know, the, the first thing is making sure you know enough about your members and customers to actually segment them. And, and, and th this is one of the things, you know, we were talking about um, kind of the risks of the thing, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. One of the things that I'm constantly lecturing my clients about is don't collect data for the sake of collecting data or don't collect data just because you can um, make sure whatever data you're collecting, you actually would use and not so it's not so it, it's will use not may use <laughs> so if you if you're going to collect something and you say well we might use that someday my answer usually is then don't do it until you know you're going to use it and so farhad that's to your point of segmentation which is a lot of times marketers will say well if i know x y and z then i can chop up this list and really do things and that's great if that's true but we've got to make sure that uh, whatever data we're collecting, we would actually use in a segmentation case or use for some other marketing or communications effort. And then it's okay to collect that. And then we have to be sure that we're continually collecting that data, keeping it clean. I mean, I'll just sh share one simple example that uh, a client of mine from this a couple of years ago, where I was working with an association to help them. Basically, we we're just trying to help them uh, manage their data more effectively. They were having some significant issues internally with, frankly, with staff conflict where part of the organization was doing something that the other staff didn't know about and vice versa. And it was creating problems with how they're managing data and, and um, frankly, frustrating a lot of the staff. And so we talked about a lot of different things. And one of the exercises we went through was just to look at the demographic data that they were collecting. In this case, uh, it was a trade association. So they had a lot of organizational data as well as a lot of individual data. And literally the exercise, we had the um, uh, the AMS data projected up on a screen and we're walking through each field and we say, okay, what do we do with this? What do we do with that? And uh, honest God, true story. We get to a field and I say, what is that field used for? And someone in the group said, well, that was, we had a marketing director three years ago and she wanted to collect that data and then she left. And so we stopped collecting it. And I said, okay, that happens. A couple of fields later, I said, what's that field for? Very similar answer. Oh, we had a marketing director two years ago. He wanted to collect that data. Then when he left, we stopped collecting it. And a couple of fields later, you know what's going to happen. We've got yet another field, another marketing director, data that was collected for a little while and then it hasn't been collected since. And that's a really good illustration. Frankly, that, that happens. It's fairly common where we have an initiative, whether the staff is leaving or not, but we have an initiative where we collect data for a while. And then for whatever reason, we stop collecting that data. Maybe it's intentional, but most often it's unintentional. We collected it and then we stopped. And that data just clutters up the system. But more importantly, if a new marketing person comes in and says, oh, I can use that to segment my, mar my, my lists, they may be segmenting on really old data or incorrect, inaccurate data, in which case it's not useful to them. So uh, it's a very long way of saying, make sure you segment on, make sure you have data you can segment on, but make sure you have data that's actually up to date. And you're, you're actively managing that it's good data to segment on. Absolutely. And I guess like nowadays, um, it's, it, it has become quite easy to collect the data, right? So as a result, like if you, if you just like keep on collecting different fields and different data points, uh, data can easily blow up, right? And then like it becomes more noise than what you're really looking for. So, right. so I guess like it's very important to make sure that like you have a market overarching marketing or sales plan that you can tie with the data that you're actually collecting. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it is what is, what are we trying to do with the plan and what would drive that? So it's always starting with the outcomes first, what's going to get us to that end goal. What kind of data is going to get us to that end goal? Do we have that? 
the funny thing is, Farhad, that often when I'm working with my clients early on, I'll say, um, you know, we're talking about what kind of functionality they would need in the system. And then they'll, usually it's the marketing or communication people will say, I want to be able to do this, this, and this, uh, and w which is effectively segmenting the data on all kinds of industry demographics, let's say. And I learned early on in my career that the next question you have to ask is, do you actually have that data right now? And often the marketing people will say, no, I want that data. So, okay, that's, <laughs> that piece is different than the technology. The technology will manage the data, but we have to find or get the data from somewhere. And so that's a kind of a different discussion. Um, but that, you know, that <laughs> I, uh, I always have to be careful when the, when the client says, well, we can't do that. We're, we're unable to do this segmentation. And then I have to ask, okay, because of the technology or because you actually don't have the data. And if they don't have the data, that's a different discussion. Right. So what discussion would that be if they don't have the data? If they don't have the data, then of course, you know, again, always starting with the end in mind, what are you going to do with that? How would you do that if you had that data? And then usually they can explain that because, you know, marketers are smart enough that they know if I, if I know, uh, you know, again, use a trade association example, if I know the different industries they serve, or if I know their sizes or their employee numbers, things like that, then I can change the message. I said, okay, that makes sense. And then the next question always is, where would we get that data? Um, because often just asking for it, it's easy to ask, but it's harder to actually get people to respond, especially if you, I always say, you know, you can't ask for data that you, that the customer doesn't understand immediately why you would be asking that question. And so if you're asking for demographic data, a, a cynical person would say, oh, that's so you can market to me better. But if you can convince them there's a better reason, um, then you might be able to collect that data. Related to that, of course, is can we actually purchase or find that data from third party sources and bring it into the system? And so again, using that example of employees or revenues, maybe uh, Hoover's or somebody else has that data that we can buy or rent and we can put that into our system. And so the you know, first question is, do we have that data? Second question is, if we don't have that data, how would we get that data? And then <laughs> and sometimes people will just say to me, oh, that data doesn't exist. So, well, I not magic. I can't make it, <laughs> I can't make it appear either. So um, we're kind of stuck there. Right. Sometimes what we have done is that like, if we don't have a piece of data, we would kind of like leverage the next event that the organization is having to collect the data. So when they sign up for a webinar or maybe like renew their membership, you know, like we introduce like a new piece of data to collect and see if people react well to it. If not, then so be it. But if we got it, we got it. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great idea. I always say, you know, we have to be careful about how many hoops we make them jump through to register for an event, for example. But if it's, but if it's literally a piece of data and you're testing to see if people will give us that information, I think that's a, that's a good way to go. Right. So Wes, uh, so now during the pandemic times, a lot of organizations are trying to like up their digital game, right? So uh, many people are actually looking to uh, transform their overall systems and go online more and more. So if I'm looking to reimplement my CRM or my member data management system, like where should I start? I think the first place is, um, uh, again, besides making sure we know what it is we want to collect, is making sure that the data itself is as clean as we can get it. And and so I'll, I'll add some caveats there. The first is it can never be 100% clean. And that's a big mistake that I think uh, organizations often make is they think, well, if we try hard enough, we can get 100% accuracy in our data. And that's just simply not true. So we have to <laughs> we have to recalibrate our expectations in terms of how accurate the data be, can be. 90, you know, depending on your organization, 95, 96, 97% accurate, that might be achievable, but 100% is not achievable. And so uh, the first is, again, understanding what kind of data we need. And then second is cleaning that data up, um, again, so that we have confidence in the data itself. Um, one of the things I talk about with my clients is the idea that there's no stasis in data management, meaning that either your data is getting better by virtue of what you're doing to keep it clean, or your data is getting worse by virtue of the fact that you're not doing enough to keep it clean. And so it's going in one direction or the other, it is not staying in the middle, that, that just doesn't happen. And so what, do we, what can we do to keep the data cleaner? And there's a whole bunch of things we can do. Um, one of my favorites is what I call data integrity reports, which is just, um, reports or queries that will allow us to see data that um, is potentially erroneous and update the, that as a result of that. And there's tons of examples of this across different organizations, but you know, the, uh, kind of a simple one is um, 
checking membership join and renew dates to make sure that those all make sense and that we don't you know that we're not carrying members that have already expired or that we've got bad dates things like that so it's just it's kind of those little things i call it weeding the garden because there's weeds all the time and you've got to kind of constantly keep that clean and you can use these data integrity reports to um to do that right uh wes can you tell us a bit more about the reports the type of reports that you would want to like see from your member management system uh, well, yeah. So I guess in terms of data integrity reports, it, you know, the reports that will tell us where there's potentially bad data, and that's going to vary from organization to organization. Um, I think another another type of report that is useful for membership organizations is, of course, engagement reports. And so, again, yeah, the beauty about all this is that there's kind of a core to all these ideas or concepts, but then uh, how each one, how each organization executes it, is going to be a little different. And so member, member engagement is a really good example of that, where depending on your organization, um, you're going to look at engagement in a different way, or you're going to measure engagement in a different way. And so a trade association, again, just broadly speaking, trade association is going to look at what individuals related to those organizational members are doing. So they have to roll that information up to, you know, company X as Farhad and Wes and, and others as employees. So what are all of us doing as individuals? roll that up to the organization and look at what the organization is doing. That's going to be how they measure member engagement. Whereas an individual membership organization obviously is going to do it at the individual level only, or I shouldn't say only, because it's possible that uh, if you're really advanced, you might have an individual membership organization where multiple individuals from the same organization will become members of your association, in which case you might want to measure it at both the individual and the organizational level. That's pretty advanced stuff, but it, it can be done. And so um, I think back to your question about reporting, you know, re being able to query a report on membership engagement, um, I think is, is a really critical piece that uh, pretty much every association should be doing. And like everything else, the way to start that is to start as simple as possible. Choose three to five um, elements that you want to measure and make sure you're capturing that data and then make sure you can measure that. I'm curious, Far, you must, you must encounter that yourself with your clients. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I guess like uh, one of the most important things that uh, in terms of like, member engagement, like what we have to like find out is like, what does engagement mean for this organization? Right. So oftentimes like an email open can be an in engagement uh, and for certain clients an email open is not big enough because they have so many people opening emails. Right. So right, in, right. in that case, probably a better engagement like metric to track would be uh, are they coming to our webinars? Are they coming to our events? Right. Uh, so, yeah. So, so Wes, like, uh, tell me about engagement a, a little more. The organization that you have worked with, how did you do engagement tracking? So, um, it can be done a couple of different ways. The nice thing is that more and more off the shelf association management software systems actually have this built in to where you can set up what you want to measure, how you want to measure it, you know, score it and so on. And so I'll, I'll what I'll do is I'll talk about, um, the shoestring version versus the, the built-in version. Um, I worked with a client a couple years ago who had a fantastic member engagement uh, program, but it was kind of half shoestring and half uh, technology. The technology piece was capturing all the data. Uh, the shoestring piece was actually downloading that into spreadsheets and then manipulating it in the spreadsheet so that they could look at what they wanted to look at. And in their case, what they did, they actually, um, I, I don't, I don't recommend this approach because they were they out of the box they did it this way or out of the gate they did it this way and it, it was really hard but they were able to pull it off but they actually identified 12 different engagement points that they wanted to measure and they measured that over the course of a year and uh, they were uh, organizational membership trade associations so they were measuring it at the organizational level and what they measured among other things was uh, event attendance um, committee service writing for the organization um, uh, they, they did what they called site visits where a senior staff person would actually visit the organization's office somewhere in the United States. And so they track that, um, they have a kind of a, what I would call a customer service group. And so if you co made calls in and they gave you advice, they tracked that. So they were tracking all these different engagement points and that was all tracked in one system, which was smart because then they could download all that information, but they didn't have a built-in report per se. And so they had to download that into a spreadsheet and then manipulate it that way. 
And so that's kind of a, a mix between the, it's a hybrid of the shoestring version versus the technology version. But the pure technology version, they, some AMS is now will let you say, okay, here's what I'm going to measure. Events, registration, membership, could be the length of membership, um, could be the products that they're buying. D did they make donations, things like that. Then allowing you to weight that, that certain things are worth more points than other things. And then if you're getting really fancy, you can age that stuff so that if I purchased something a year ago, that's actually worth, worth less than if I purchased something a month ago and on and on and on. And then the system actually does that with the setup, does it automatically. And so when I look at that individual's record or that organizational's record, I can see right there what their engagement score is at the moment. And that's, again, that's super advanced, but that's, that's happening now. And uh, so that's, a, again, a way of really segmenting who's engaged, who isn't. But I do want to, Farad, I want to add one thing here, because this is kind of a, uh, a soapbox of mine. And that is, having been a membership director for three different trade associations over 10 years, one thing I discovered was there are a lot of organizations who will be members of your organization, your association, who will never be engaged. And so this is especially true of trade associations, but it's certainly true of, of IMOs as well that I'll join to be a member to get the magazine or to get the other access, but I'm never going to come to an event. I'm never going to buy anything else from you, but I'll keep renewing. And um, so they are kind of actively disengaged, but they're not going to drop membership. They're going to keep renewing for any number of reasons. And I raise that point only to say that we have to acknowledge that because often marketers will spend a lot of time and money and effort trying to get those people to be more engaged. And it's kind of like, you know, with my kids, no matter how much I kick them, they're not going to mow the lawn. So eventually you just give up You say, all right, I know you're going to exist. You're not going to mow the lawn. Same, you know, they're going to keep paying their dues. So let them do that. Let them be engaged the way they want to be engaged and, and otherwise leave them alone. doesn't mean ignore them, but it doesn't mean, you know, you can't keep sending them stuff to say, come to this event because they just aren't going to. Right, right. So where's, how do we leave them alone in a case like this? What is a good approach? <laughs> um, I would say, well, so so the one thing is to make sure, and again, you have to be really careful about this because you got to be sure that you've kind of actively identified that they are uh, what used to be called a mailboxer, that they'll just keep respond, they'll keep renewing and they'll take the stuff that you mail them, but they're not going to ever engage otherwise. So we have to actively make that decision. And once we do, you could just, you know, think of it as a suppressed list that I'm not going to send any promotional stuff to Wes because I know he doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't want that promotional stuff. I will, of course, send him his renewals and I'll send him the monthly um, news update because that's news, that's not promotional. But I'm basically just gonna always ignore him when it comes to actually promoting things um, because there's no reason to clutter up his mailbox. And I would, so I, I wanna add this, again, absolutely true story. Uh, and I think every association, every association knows this intuitively and they probably all feel they're guilty of it, which is over communicating, which basically just means sending way too many emails to too many people too often. And I was working with a, an association a couple of years ago and the direct, I think it was the director of marketing. She told me, she said, we just had a board meeting last week and the chairman of the board said to me, he, he was, and he did not say this in a good way. He said, I have turned off your emails. And she said, what do you mean? She said, he said, I've got my email. I told my IT guy to set it up so that your emails just go to junk because you send me like, he said, I finally counted and it was 40 a week or something like that. And that's the chairman of the board saying, I don't want to hear from the association that I chair. Again, an extreme case, but that happens. And uh, we have to be really careful about over communicating because you're just going to make people angry and turn you off. So I guess we need to give these members uh, a way to self-identify that like which communication I want to be like engaged in. And then, you know, like kind of like give them a way to unsubscribe from all the emails, but maybe membership or anything that is most important. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I'm glad you said that because explicitly everybody should have those, I call them subscription centers, but it's the, it's the opt out, the ability to opt out of specific communications so that, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a good example as, um, as an association member myself, I don't have interest in certification, but I do have interest in the other educational stuff. I do have interest in the government relations stuff. Um, I don't have interest in chapter relations because I don't do that. So I want to be able to say, yeah, send me the government relations stuff. Send me 
the um, membership stuff, of course, the event stuff, but don't send me certification. I'm never going to do that. And don't send me, uh, you know, donations, whatever it is. So yes to some, no to some. We got to be able to, we have to really have to work to allow our members to do that. Right, right. Alrighty. So I'm just going to take a quick pause here and let the audience know that we are open to taking questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please type on chat and we'll pick up your questions whenever we take a short break. All right. Um, so Wes, um, um, I think there's a lot for our audience to take in at this point, but like, so yeah. you, you mentioned that at, um, uh, at one level, we have to like start by looking at what the technology will give us, how much engagement report and how much engagement data the technology will give us. And then like, what can we do ourselves like with the report that the like a uh, tool will give us, right? So um, uh, if we have the freedom to actually choose a CRM or a member data management tool right now, right? What are some of the things that we should consider before before buying a tool? Well, I think um, if we're talking specifically about what, you know, CRM or membership management uh, systems, the things I would look for would include um, being able to measure engagement. So that should be, you know, quote unquote, built in like scoring member engagement. I think um, what I would generically call workflows is something you should be looking for. And what workflows do is allow us to automate processes. And um, again, I think that's really important because the, <laughs> the whole point of technology is to kind of make our lives easier and take the mundane tasks away and um, workflow automation can do that. So that's a, that's a, that's a big one. And then I would say, you know, this kind of goes without, or it's, it's obvious, but I'll state it anyway, which is the system has to be open enough to be able to integrate to any third party systems that we want to use. And because, because the reality is now, I mean, I don't, I'm certain I don't have a single client that is using us, you know, a single system for everything. In other words, they probably have an email tool. They definitely have a website, which may or may not be coming from the AMS. Um, of course, they have a financial management system, but they might have a learning management system. They might have a government relations system. They might have a donation system. There are so many other uh, purpose specific platforms that are out there that do things really, really well. And we want to plug those two together. So having a system that is actually open enough to integrate to third party systems is really critical too. Yeah, we often hear from uh, many of our clients that like, can we actually like get that one tool that will do everything for us? And I guess like uh, I keep telling them that like that one tool does not exist, right? So you kind right. of have to like uh, do the best, like uh, make a decision on the AMS system or maybe the CRM system and then like uh, whatever whatever gaps that you're actually like seeing in the system, then like find other tools to fill the like, gap and make sure that like they can talk to each other. Um, yeah, have you, have yeah, you, have I, you I, seen... I think... I was going to say, I think that's exactly right. And I, you know, the, I always tell my clients, if a, if a system existed that did everything, I would own it and be very rich. So it, you know, just simply does not, it doesn't exist. And so you got to do the, do the best you can, uh, you know, the 80, 20 rule applies, get 80% of the way there and, or think about what are the things that a third party system can really do for you and use the third party system, but make sure they talk to each other. Right. So, uh, so say that we have a CRM system in place right now, right? And then like we have, um, you know, not uh, completely clean data, but to some extent, like 80% clean, right? Uh, what are some things that you would apply like on the database to, to maintain the data properly? In, in, in terms of just trying to keep the data clean over time? Yeah, or, or maybe like other like uh, data management practices. Like what would you yeah. do? What are your best practices? I, I think, um... You know, a big one is, as I mentioned, those data integrity reports that, so, so the, I guess, take a step back instead of just thinking about process, but thinking about philosophy, which is philosophically, again, understanding that either the data is getting better, or it's getting worse. And in order for it to be better, we have to actively manage. And so actively manage means that we have processes in place that allow us to manage the data. And so, you know, there are quote unquote, simple things like um, duplicate detection, either reports or some systems actually have that built in. So it, uh, it identifies if you might be actually entering a, a duplicate record. Um, dupl I mean, everyone, I'm sure you hear it too. Every one of my clients, they talk about the fact that they've got duplicate records. And that's one of those realities, again, why we can't have 100% clean data because there's no such thing as 100% clean. If you have even one duplicate, you're not 100% clean. And every one of my clients has duplicate records because people duplicate their own or staff does it, it happens. So having a, having a system that either helps you identify that or having a report that will help you identify those, that's, that's one way to do that. 
um, uh, you know, making sure that we're not, make sure that we're not actually creating rules that will make data collection more difficult. And so I talk about, you know, the idea that you don't want to create rules that are all around the exception, let staff manage that stuff and automate everything else. Um, again, you know, so a lot of this is about expectations and just, you know, managing that expectation of, again, it's not going to be perfect, but we want to catch, we want to take care of the 80% as automatic as possible. And then the humans get to deal with the last 20%. And frankly, it's that last 20% that um, kind of drives everybody crazy uh, and gets people, you know, really excited or, or angry. Right, right. So, um, uh, Wes, you mentioned automation a few times here, right? So, uh, which which areas do you think are most important to automate? So, I think, um, and again, this it'll depend on the type of organization, the type of association, but um, automating the membership join and renewal process, or especially the renewal process, automating that as much as possible makes a lot of sense for a small a fur trade association that has a small list of members that might not make sense but you know i've had clients who have tens if not hundreds of thousands of members and if you're talking about hundreds hundreds of thousands of members then obviously you want to have something that's going to automate that as much as humanly possible um and so anything anything that is what i would call a mundane transaction so obviously automating uh if someone registers for an event automating all the communications that go out after that um, that, that kind of thing should be automated. Um, and then, you know, again, any, any other transactions, anytime they're spending money with us or they're talking to us via the website, there should be some kind of, um, automation that communicates back with them and all of that. And, and then, you know, one, one thing that I'm starting to see with associations is, uh, the idea of a chat bot on the website, which can, can provide a lot of automated information as well. And so um, those common, you know, the questions that you commonly get, the FAQs, we used to call them in the good old days, the frequently asked questions, that can be automated at the website level where they just in the chat bot say, how do I renew my membership? And the system tells, tells them that to the point of being smart enough to say, I want to renew. And then the, the system says, tell me who you are and I'll take you to your renewal page and let you do it right there. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, Wes, we'll take one question from the audience. So, Barbara is asking, uh, do the data integrity reports uncover or identify the nasty spreadsheets that people keep using as workarounds? And then, um, how do we get people to feed the data into the platform directly? So, th that's two different, two different questions. The first one is what I call um, shadow systems or shadow databases. So, even spreadsheets, but other systems where people are managing data outside of the primary system. And sometimes there's actually a really good reason for it. And we just want to be able to identify it and then figure out how we can integrate that information. So, so sometimes a good reason being the AMS can't actually manage that data or it doesn't need to manage all that data. So um, not a great example, but you know, um, exhibit sales, it may not be managed in the AMS or, or prospecting for exhibit sales, things like that. So we have a separate system to allow that, but then we want to bring some of that data back into the primary system. So I think, um, I think, uh, so Barbara, I think the, you know, the answer is the data integrity reports don't necessarily identify that. That happens more often when there's just conversations in the hallway, back when we had hallways, um, where we, uh, we discover, oh, they're managing data in a spreadsheet. Why can't we manage that in the AMS? So we do have to, we always have to be looking for that. And then there, uh, the second question was um, feeding data into the platform so the reports are accurate. That actually is often where these uh, shadow databases are discovered because someone, whether it's the marketing director, communication director, or even the executive director will say, tell me everything about person X or, or company X. And then we start to realize, oh, I can tell you that, but it comes from seven different places. And then that's my cue to say, okay, why is it in seven different places? Well, let's talk about that. Is there a way to, again, either to integrate or to bring that data in? And um, I mean, I worked uh, working with a client right now we're talking about a huge amount of data here and they have um, in their case, besides AMS, they have two other significant systems that relate to journal publishing. And so those data, those systems are integrated to an extent, but not completely. So when the director of publications pulls information, she has this tremendous report she puts together once a month, but she still is pulling it from three systems and she has to massage data after the fact. And so we would like to, 
to the extent possible, shortcut that or automate that. And so that will require some deeper integrations. But that I bring that up just because when we look at that report, then we go, you know, if we're asking the question, where did that data come from? That's when we discover, oh, it's, there's all kinds of tentacles into that report. How can we integrate those better? And, and again, I, I want to, I want to, I want to reemphasize something right now, since I brought up, since I said all this, sometimes integration doesn't make sense from a purely dollars perspective. And again, a, a simple example is I have plenty of clients who um, sell exhibit space, but the reality is they only sell about 15 spaces and they're only prospecting to about 50 companies, you know, so we're under a hundred contacts total. And so, yes, we could integrate that into the system or we could build it into the AMS or whatever. But the reality is it is much easier and much more sensible from a dollar's perspective just to do that in the spreadsheet and then bring those pieces in. All of that is this, a long way of saying sometimes you just can't automate it all because it, dollars wise, it doesn't make sense to. I think that's a very good point, Wes. That's a very good point that it has to, there has to be a good return on investment. People think that we should do it just for the sake of doing it. But like, unless, yeah. uh, if you're spending $10,000 on any digital project, you have to like uh, know that you're making at least that $10,000 and more back. If not, then maybe there's not much value in doing that. Right, that's exactly right. I would always say, I'm the laziest person in the world. One of the reasons I love technology is because it'll do all the work for me. And I love automating things, but sometimes you just go, I don't, think that makes a lot of sense to you know spend 10 hours automating something that takes me 10 minutes a month to do it just doesn't make sense but it's yeah. hard it's really hard <laughs> hard to come to that decision yeah and also to add to that i guess like one approach that we have been taking is um sometimes like it's okay to actually like uh, break away from the ams and then maybe use spreadsheets for a short-term project and then like for those what we do is that we make sure that we can go out of the AMS or the CRM, like uh, do a short-term processing for an event or something, but have a way to feed the data back into the CRM. So the spreadsheet, like yeah. whatever processing we have done, it cannot like live by itself on the Excel. Something has to come back, right? So what are we bringing back to the CRM? And uh, also on top of that, like another thing that we see is that like if you're breaking away from the CRM and then you're using Excel, and if that is happening too many times too often, that like, you're spending a lot of time doing that, then maybe it's a good candidate for automation at that point. Yep, I think I totally agree with both those points. If you're doing stuff outside the system and you're actually changing data outside the system, be sure you consider what needs to be brought back into the primary system. And then, like you said, if you re if you start looking, you're like, I do this ten times a ten times a month every month. That's probably an opportunity for uh, automation. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, Wes, uh, who should have access to the CRM or the AMS system? Who in the organization? So I. Th I the way I look at it is, um, I always say I'm a big liberal when it comes to access, meaning that everybody who wants it should have access. And so the real question becomes not who should have access, but at what level or how much access should they have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot, a lot of people are honest and say, look, I don't actually need much data out of there, or I don't need it very often, or I don't want to be responsible for breaking something. So I don't go in there because I'm afraid I might do something wrong. And so we want to make sure that we give those those people read only access and, and to tell them, look, you can go in and look to your heart's content. You can't actually do anything to this to break it. So don't be afraid and go in there and run these reports and do whatever it is you need to do. So um, again, it's give everybody access who wants it and consider what type of access they have. Uh, it, very often executive directors say to me, look, I just want to run reports. I'm never going to, I'll look people up. I'll look up companies. I'm never going to change data i'm never going to you know do a transaction and that's fine so you give them read-only access and teach them how to look stuff up and find the reports that they need and then it just it kind of elevates from there to where that next level of person who might need to be able to change data or who might be able to you know query data and, and um, pull stuff for a broadcast email or whatever it is and then you know you just keep going from there and my advice always is give people as little access as possible and add as you need to as opposed to giving them all access and then taking stuff away. Because if you take stuff away, they get mad, even if they weren't using it. 
Right, right. And I guess like I subscribe to your like liberal philosophy on this as well, that like give people access at the beginning, but maybe read only, but give them some level of access. Uh, mainly because what we find is that like when people see the data, you know, like they, they can, we can co-create with the whole team, you know, like when our team members see that, okay, oh, you know what, we have this three, four data points, maybe we could do this with this, right? So unless we show them that data, they will never be able to like uh, help us with like new ideas. I, that's a great point. Uh, you know, it's in one sense, it's the more cooks in the kitchen, the better because everyone's seeing that data and they can contribute where where it makes sense. But again, con controlling that to say, you, you give me all your ideas, I'm not going to let you break it. <laughs> yeah, I think absolutely. That's a great idea. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to like turn back to the audience one more time to see if anyone has any questions. Uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions, please feel free to type on chat and we will pick up a question from there. All right. Um, well, so we are towards the end of the episode, but, uh, do you have any like last words for associations or member based organizations? Yeah, I think again, just reemphasizing a couple of things. One is, um, to just be very careful about expectations. Um, you know, this idea that <laughs> I tell this story all the time because, uh, a long time ago when I very first started working in associations, I, uh, I worked for a trade association. And we produced a printed directory. It was called a blue book because it was a buyer's guide. What it actually listed was companies who made very large scale manufacturing equipment. And um, it literally was the Bible of that industry. It was used around the world and we printed it up, you know, spent a ton of money on this every couple of years to produce it and mail it around the world. And um, the, the joke at the time with printed directories is that a printed directory is out of date the minute it hits the street. And that's because we, we literally collected that data six months prior. And by the time we printed it, something had changed, uh, you know, addresses had changed, people had died, whatever. So, um, so that was the joke, printed directory is out of date the minute it hits the street. Well, the reality is, like I said earlier, even now we have online directories, which means it's connected right to our database. And that's the most recent data, right? But the reality is that that data is going to be wrong sometimes too. So even the online directories are out of date, so to speak. And all of that is to say, we have to manage our expectations about what is possible and 100% accurate is not possible, but we can be really, really good at the stuff that really, really matters. I mean, one of the things that I see very frequently, uh, associations will get upset because data is wrong about their board of directors. And, and, I, and that is understandable. I would be upset too, you know, if you're, if I'm on the board and you got my data wrong, but again, we have to look at why that's happening and acknowledge whether or not, was it a mistake we actually made? Is it something we're doing that's causing this? Or is the fact that the board member changed companies and didn't tell us because that happens too. And so, you know, again, managing those expectations and acknowledging it's not going to be perfect, but it can be really good. I think that's the most important thing. And then I would say secondarily, but completely related is acknowledging and understanding that when we make decisions about how we do things, we are always making a trade-off when we, whichever path we choose. So if we, we talked already about automating versus not automating. And so the trade-offs we're making, if we automate is it's going to cost time and money to get it to the automated state. That's the trade-off we're making versus if we don't automate, the trade-off is it's going to be more work for us to manage that manually. Which one's right? I don't know, <laughs> but we have to we have to discuss that, and we have to acknowledge that whatever decision we make, we are making a trade off to make that decision. And every single decision we make in life is that way. You know, choosing to talk to you today means I'm not talking to someone else right now, and that's the trade off I've chosen to make. And people who are attending, they've chosen to attend rather than do something else. So we're always making trade offs. And when it comes to managing data and the technology that's related to it. The same thing applies. We're making trade-offs and we just, I always tell my clients, I want you to make the decision with eyes wide open. Do you understand the trade-off you're making? Do you acknowledge that that's the trade-off you want to make? And we'll, we'll go forward from there. Right. Well, so I do have to ask you one more question. So, um, sure. uh, when you say the, when you give the example of like, uh, a uh, board member's information not being uh, accurate on the website or, or on the system, right? So I guess like it's, um, there can be like uh, two things there. Maybe like there was no way for the board member to like self, 
uh, correct the data, to, right? So that may be yep. that, or maybe like no one in the organization like took the initiative to actually like review all the data, right? So how would you solve a problem like that? Because we see that happening many, many times. I think um, always you just, you have to go back to, okay, what, what caused that problem? And so I'll give you an extreme example. I worked with a group, this is a long time ago, um, but we were looking at, at getting a new system for them. And part of the reason they needed a new system is because they actually had four active systems in place. They had a membership system, and then separate from that was their, their email mail newsletter mailing list system. And then separate from that was their committees list, which is where the board lived. And then separate from that, I think, was a donation system. And so they had four systems not talking to each other. And again, true story, board member called and said, I need to update my address because I've moved and the staff person did it, but she only did it in one of the four systems. And this board member was in all four systems. Yeah. And so the next, you know, the next month, you know what happened? The board member called back and said, still getting mail at the other place. And the other staff person said, oh, I see it's not updated here. And they fixed it, but they only fixed it in the number two place, not the three and a four place. And so in their case, they had bad process, bad systems set up. It's, it, I mean, it, it was absolutely their fault because the board member was calling. And so I think that's that's where you have to go first is to determine why is this happening. Um, to your point, Farah, that the the, um, the idea that the member had to call because they couldn't do it online that maybe that's a technology issue. Might also be that the board member doesn't care and they don't you know couldn't make the effort to figure out how to log in. So you know, I always say, especially when it comes to board members, we have to be really careful because a lot of times they just want to be have their hands held. And when you say, oh, you can log in and do this, they'll say, I'm not going to do that. Well, there's nothing I can do about that. If you're going to be obstinate, you're going to be obstinate and we're just going to have to hold your hand. So uh, so we had, we just have to be really careful about what is actually causing the problem. And um, and so, you know, it, as they always say, get to the root cause, understand what caused it in the first place, then we can address that. But just, just virtue of a staff or a, a board member complaining about something, it's not enough information. Right, right. So uh, we'll take another question from Kevin. Uh, what is the number one ex uh, expectation that you hear these days that has to be managed? <laughs> Very good one. Yes, I think, I, I, I think honestly, I, I think the number one expectation is that this is especially true as we're looking at new systems, um, that the new system will fix everything. That's the expectation is we've talked about it. Now you're going to fix that, right? And this, again, gets back to trade-offs and ROI is um, I have to kind of lecture my clients all the way through. Understand, this system can do that. In fact, I had this conversation this morning with a, with a client. Um, the system can do that or can do it. We can make it do that. But you're going to spend $10,000 to fix something that if we just change how we do what we're doing, we're going to avoid about $8,000 of those charges. So, you know, again, the staff person's expectation is with this new system, I'll do it just like I did in the old system. It's just in the, you know, in a shinier package. And the reality is we're not going to do it like you did in the old system because you had actually created more trouble than solving, you know, than solutions. And we're going to kind of back up and say, okay, we're going to do it a different way because that'll be less expensive and actually makes more sense. And so, you know, again, the expectation is the system will do everything and it's just not going to happen. That's a very good one, Wes. And I guess like uh, also sometimes what we see is that uh, just because an organization has been doing this a certain way for a very long time doesn't mean that is the right way. And on the other hand, the AMS system implemented that particular process in a in a given way because they saw many, many other people doing it that, that way, which may be actually better. So sometimes the association actually also has to understand that, you know what, like they're doing it that way, maybe for a reason, maybe we should change our process and not like fix the tool, right? Yes. That, and that you're absolutely right. And um, I think most vendors, I was having this conversation with another software vendor the other day, most vendors would tell you that's um, really hard to do. <laughs> it's hard to convince them. Some, some of my clients are really good about it. They'll say, tell me what to do and we'll do it. But others will say, look, I've done it this way for 15 years and now you're telling me to do it a totally different way and I'm just not going to. So do what you can. Right, right. So I'm going to go back to the audience one more time. Uh, if you have any questions, please type on chat. Uh, before we wrap up, don't be shy. Please go ahead. We'd love to hear from you. You have this for only five or 10 more minutes. Now's your chance. Now's your chance. Okay. 
So while we wait for the questions, so I'm going to like uh, uh, shoot two rapid fire questions for you, Wes. Uh, can you share a personal habit uh, that has contributed the most to your success? Ooh, good question. Personal habit that is, I think um, the ability to say no. So saying no, saying no to, so in my case, because I work with, you know, associations saying no to, to bad potential clients where I, where it's clear that either it's a fit, it's not a fit personally, or it's not a fit in terms of my um, skill set. So just saying, no, I can't help you. And I'm always trying to help them find somebody else who can help them and be able to say no to that. And then just saying no to, uh, you know, people will call up and say, can I bend your ear for an hour? Like, well, no. <laughs> Uh, there's got to be more to it than that. So being able, being able to say no to things, I think it's been very helpful. So we are very lucky that you joined our podcast, Wes. Thank you for that. You didn't say no to me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, and Wes, like another rapid fire question. Uh, can you share a digital tool or a strategy that makes you effective in your work? Uh, I would so yes. Um, it's kind of a combination of tool and strategy. I use uh, a, the product called Microsoft To Do, which is just a simple to do list, checklist. And what I do is I actually have, among other things, uh, part of this is kind of stolen from um, Getting Things Done by uh, David, what's his name? I forget his last name right now. But the, the Getting David Things Allen. Done author, you know. Okay. Yeah, David Allen, thank you. Um, part, part of it's stolen from him, and then part of it is my own creation, which is I have um, all my clients listed in that to do as separate lists. And then I just keep that to-do list updated on what either I need to do with the client or what I've just done and I'm waiting on them to respond. So because I'll, at any given time, I may be working with eight to 15 clients at a time. And so I can just scan right to that and say, okay, here's the last thing I did with group X and here's what I'm waiting on. This is why there's nothing happening right now, for example. Um, so just the idea of uh, keeping track of the back and forth, so to speak, and it's not a, you know, it's not a huge list, actually. It's usually just one or two things per client because there's something happening. And I say, okay, I've done this. Now I'm waiting for them to give me that. So, so do you Microsoft actually follow to do. the... Microsoft Sorry. to do, okay. Do you actually follow the getting things done method overall? I, I, uh, in certain aspects, yes. So for example, my, in my email inbox, um, of course, it's gotten stuff in there now because I've been online with you for an hour. But uh, at the end of the day, if it's got more than three emails, it'll get cleaned out. I, 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 do, not use my, I do not use my inbox as my to-do list. I've got other things for that. So my email is really clean. My wife's email inbox is over 100,000 now. So that's the uh, contrast. <laughs> Kevin says inbox bankruptcy. <laughs> I probably have 10,000 plus in my inbox right now that I'm not even reading, you know, and it's never going right. to be read, right? So yeah. Yeah. And that, so you were talking about the habits. That's another one of mine is um, uh, if I get email that I don't want, I instantly unsubscribe. I'm always, I'm just very anal about my email inbox and keeping that clean. And I don't want to hear, don't send me, I, <laughs> I got something today. I'm like, I'm, I surprised myself at how often I get offended when people put me on their mailing list and I didn't ask them to be on the mailing list. They like, don't, I didn't ask for this. Don't send that to me. Just click on subscribe and get on with my life. <laughs> that's right that's right so i guess the danger of like using your inbox as a to-do list is that like uh it's a to-do list that other people can actually add to-dos for you right and then it's not in your yep. control other people are adding things on your list right so never use your email inbox as your to-do list yeah precisely precisely all righty good so Wes, uh where can people reach you if they have more more questions for you or they want to get in touch so my website's affecteddatabase.com. I have a, a weekly newsletter that you can sign up for and a monthly newsletter. There's two, two different newsletters. And um, you can reach me at wes at effectivedatabase.com or through LinkedIn at Wes Trogel. And um, yeah. Alrighty, perfect. So uh, last call for the audience. If you have any questions, uh, now is your time. We're going to wrap up in a couple of minutes. So we'll leave the line open for a few more minutes if you have any questions. And looks like overall the um, live podcast didn't go that bad. Uh, nothing blew up. The connection was fine, you know. So, so we are glad that it actually worked out. We will probably do more live podcasts in the future. Good. I enjoyed it, Farhad. It was great.
Thank you so much. All right, Wes, uh, I guess we don't have any other questions, so we're going to wrap up at this point. So thank you so much for everyone joining us in the live podcast. And Wes, uh, thanks a lot to you as well for taking some time to speak to us in your busy, very busy schedule. Absolutely. Enjoyed it. Thanks. Alrighty. Thanks, everyone. We'll speak to you on another episode. Bye for now. That was the podcast episode for today. If you have any questions for our guests, please reach out to them directly, or you can also send us a message on our website at gripe.ca and we will pass on the message for you. And once again, if you want to grow the membership of your professional association, please take a look at the workshops on our website at gripe.ca slash workshops. That is G-R-Y-P-E dot C-A slash workshops. All right then, I'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now.